So uh, hello everyone uh, to uh, the concurrent session number 114 uh, about flexibility. I'm Felipe Gonzalez Venegas. I will be this uh, session chair. Um, we will have four interesting presentations uh, around the whole, how to implement flexibility, how uh, how this affect they affect uh, the electricity systems and different actors and. Uh, I hope we'll uh, have really interesting discussions. Um, the first presentation, presentation is by me. So I hope you will find it too interesting. Uh, I will share my screen. Okay, so you can see my presentation in full screen. Everything's cool. Yes, okay. Yes. Okay, thanks. So uh, I am going to present a part of my research, which is uh, the role of penalties in long-term flexibility tenders. Uh, it, this work is uh, made uh, as well with my supervisors, Marc Petit and Janique Perez. Um, and uh, well, uh, I will... Um, tell you all about it there. So a little bit, a little bit, a little word before. Uh, I'm working with Stellantis. Stellantis is the third largest car manufacturer with main brands uh, Peugeot, Citroën, uh, Fiat, Chrysler, and uh, they are really interested in all the electromobility development and research. Um, for that, they have this uh, research uh, chair. Uh, that's been working about uh, ten, for about 10 years on, on different aspects of uh, electric vehicle development and grid integration. And within that research group is where, where I'm working. Uh, and in this case, I'm working in particular with uh, integration of electric vehicles into distribution systems. So uh, this is my agenda. agenda. Um, I will talk a little bit about why we need flexibility for distribution grids what are long-term flexibility tenders that you maybe not know about them. Uh, and then a case study about electric vehicle participation in, this, in these tenders. Um, so why do we need flexibility? Uh, well, basically because of the power system are facing serious challenges due to the integration of uh, distributed generation and um, also electrification of new uses such as mobility, heating, uh, IT, and these are, are creating new constraints, new requirements in the in the system, uh, having uh, backward flows, flows, uh, and this additional uh, load and generation can create con conditions, which may lead to significant investments required to maintain the same quality of supply in the, in the grids. Um, and this is particularly true to distribution systems, which are the medium and low voltage systems where most of these distributed assets will be connected. Uh, however, using flexibility uh, can help distribution grids, both operation and planning by reducing congestions and then thus having less need to uh, build new cables, uh, build bigger transformers, and they can even uh, provide a, a higher and better operation and better quality of supply to end users. For example, as providing backup power in case of any default in the grid. Um, yeah, among all these different distributed assets, uh, in particular electric vehicles can be a really interesting assets to provide flexibility through smart charge, which is like unidirectional charging, uh, shifting the load uh, to low, the charging to low impact hours, for example, as well as V2G, which is bidirectional charging, where the vehicle can also provide energy to the, to the uh, distribution system. Uh, and this way they can create value for grid operators, for aggregators, uh, for different stakeholders in the, in the electricity system. Uh, and in particular also they can lower the cost of total owner ownership for end users 
And this is really important if we want to really boost the diffusion of electric vehicles. I don't know if you saw the IEE, I, the International Energy Association presentation the other day, uh, but we need to stop uh, um, selling combustion vehicles by 2035. So uh, there are serious challenges to boost the efficiency of electric vehicles. Um, so how do we implement flexibility at the distribution level? Actually, we have different frameworks. Um, in the presentations later, we will talk about uh, some of them. Uh, you have net first, uh, you can use tariffs, network tariffs, like, such as uh, capacity tariffs or peak of peak tariffs that will incentivize users to uh, shift uh, to adapt their consumption patterns. Uh, you can have uh, smart contracts, for example, uh, where you will have a reduced capacity to take energy from the grid in constrained hours. But what has been really uh, taken a lot of research and, and there is a lot of uh, impact or yeah, interest going on lately is about market-based uh, solutions. And a lot of that of, of research has been done on short-term flexibility markets or local flexibility markets that will couple in a, in a day ahead or intraday fashion to solve uh, con congestions that may happen in the distribution grid. However, what's really interesting, and I think is much less uh, research about this, are long-term flexibility tenders. And they have already been, they, they have been implemented in the UK since 2018, and recently in France as well. Um, and they have been an interesting um, mechanism to uh, unlock flexibility. So how did they work? Uh, basically, um, in the in flex, long-term flexibility tenders, the DSO identifies some zones and periods where, for example, congestion may occur and where they might need flexibility to, to operate their grids. Uh, you can see that in this, uh, in this screenshot. Uh, here is an area in London uh, where they will the, the DSO was needed flexibility, and this was needed. Uh, this flexibility was needed only in a specific period of time. In this case, between February and March, uh, at, uh, at in the morning till uh, uh, three thirty p.m. and only in weekdays. So they know that given the consumption patterns, they, the flexibility might be needed, but only in these periods. So they. They set up a tender. They um, <clears throat> and different actors provide bids, and then uh, they award contracts between for between one up to seven years for flexibility provision. And what's really interesting as well is that the people that uh, get a, a contract they are required to be available during these these periods between February and March, for example, but uh, the activation is done in real time and only a few times per year. It's not that every day you need this flexibility. Um, uh, what's really interesting as well is that in the case of uh, uh, the UK PN, UK Power Networks, the London area, the DSO, uh, the, the tender they carried out last year was a huge success. They awarded contracts in over 50 different areas of their grid. Uh, and, um, and also the value of flexibility was, could be really, really high, though although it varied a lot according to each area. And you can see that in this graphic on the right, where the value of flexibility in average was around 60 pounds per firm kilowatt per year. So it could be significant money, but this varied between two to five pounds and to over 200 pounds per kilowatt. So imagine if you have a battery or an electric vehicle that can provide 10 kilowatts, uh, you can be making a lot of money only for supporting the grid, the, the distribution grid. Um, 
So why uh, having long-term tenders? They are really interesting for DSOs because uh, if DSOs uh, uh, only rely on short-term solutions, for example, uh, to as an uh, to unlock flexibility as an alternative to investment deferral, as a, meaning that okay, I won't build this new line, but I will only rely on this short-term market. They can be facing serious risk if the flexibility is not available when they need it. So they can endanger the 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 grid if flexibility is not there. Uh, so these long-term term long-term tenders uh, they uh, allow risk sharing through long-term contracts. So they provide a sec the security for the assets that the flexibility will be there and they ensure a certain revenue stream for flexibility operators to develop their technologies and their business models. Uh, and what's so to ensure that the flexibility will be there will be delivered. They implement penalties. Uh, Interesting, uh, the case of UKPN and the NFEs that uh, are the two uh, tenders that I've uh, studied, they have different penalties uh, condition uh, scenarios. And therefore, uh, my question in my research question in this case was, well, what's the role of these penalties? How can these penalties affect the participation of a distributed uh, a agri resources aggregators, in particular of EVs or demand response aggregators. And in particular, because, uh, for example, EVs uh, can be uh, can provide particular challenges since they are quite variable and they, their availability is not really certain. Uh, given that, for example, uh, the electric vehicle might not be connected when I was needing it. So uh, for that, uh, we develop a methodology, um, a sim simulation-based methodology that mimics the tender process, uh, where in the first type stage, uh, we do simulations to evaluate the potential of availabilities of electric vehicles. Uh, to provide flexibility to the to to the tender, and in a second stage, we simulate the flexibility activations, and we see how well these uh, electric vehicles fleet can respond to the committed flexibility, and then we compute uh, remuneration and penalties. Uh, if you are interested, the there is the paper that uh, explains a little bit more in detail. Uh, this uh, methodology is published as a working paper in uh, by uh, Florence School of Regulation. So the link is there. You will be able to see that later. Uh, we developed a case study with uh, EV fleets. <clears throat> uh, we compared two cases of fleets. One, a company fleet that is always plugged in after work, um, which uh, for, and which uh, trial patterns are quite reliable, quite constant uh, from one day to the other. And then another uh, commuter fleet, uh, which is not necessarily plugged in every day, and which uh, travel patterns, connection patterns are a little bit more stochastic, a um, little bit more diffuse. Um, regarding the tender conditions, so we studied two availability windows in this study. In one case, we say, okay, the DSO requires flexibility only during the evening period between 5 to 8 p.m. or on a second case where the flexibility is required at any time of the day. And, uh, and then we study three penalty conditions, uh, a low penalty scenario, which is correspond, corresponds to the UKPN case, a medium one corresponding to the entities. Uh, case and a high one that uh, we built to prove a point uh, to analyze uh, the, uh, the impact of even having a stronger uh, penalties. So what are the main results? Uh, to understand the results, uh, here I show you the uh, charging and availability patterns of, the, of both fleets. You can see that uh, the company fleet arrives a little bit early, earlier than, than the commuter fleets. 
and they are always connected every day. So you can see that the V2G potential is quite high and it really matches really well, it matches really well the requirements of the grid for the uh, evening, uh, evening period, which is here marked here in, in, in yellow. Uh, so we can see that uh, it's, it will be really good, uh, yeah, a really good match. Uh, on the contrary, the, um, the commuter fleet is not, they are not all connected by, by 5 p.m. or 2 p.m. Uh, or 8 p.m. You can see that some cars are usually arriving even later. So we can see that their availability profile will be less important uh, than the, uh, Felipe, than the company. Five minutes. Five minutes, okay. So I will speed up a little bit. So on the right, you can see the, the flexibility, the availability profile for both feed, fleets uh, for the evening window. You can see that the company fleet can provide over seven kilowatt uh, flexibility uh, with really high confidence because it's always available. Uh, on the other hand, the commuter fleet, uh, you can see that they, come, that they can provide up to uh, four kilowatts, but only with really high, low confidence. And if you want to be sure that you will be able to provide the flexibility you committed, this can go to less than two kilowatts per EV, which is, you can see that it's a lot less than the the commuter fleet, the company fleet. Uh, if you analyze a full, full day window, well, the, obviously these profiles are worse because uh, neither of these two fleets can provide flexibility with 100% certainty at any time of the day, basically because uh, they are not there connected uh, for some periods of the day. Uh, so what does this mean? This means that, um, uh, when we simulate activations and uh, we analyze how much, what will be the revenue and the risk that they will, that these fleets will, will see. Uh, in the case of the evening window, the company fleet, which is really reliable, they will be able to provide high levels of flexibility with high confidence and there is no problem for them. However, for the um, commuter fleet, um, they can't really provide this, the, a high level of flexibility uh, with high reliability. So in this case, the penalties will impact what will be the optimum level of flexibility to be provided uh, by this aggregator. So if flexibility uh, conditions are low, the aggregator will say, okay, I can provide a high level of flexibility. And if I'm if I fail, there is not much problem because uh, the, the, the penalties are low. So in this case, for example, you can see that, the, um, that with low penalties, the aggregator will beat the level with 40% confidence. But as penalties become more strict, they will be forced or encouraged inside to provide flexibility with a higher reliability. So in the case of medium penalties, they already provide flexibility with an 85% uh, 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 reliability. So we can see that there is a trade-off between expected revenue and risk and that high penalties make aggregators propose only high confidence bids. And for the full day window, we can see the same pattern with a high penalties uh, inciting aggregators to provide only high reliability bits. Um, what does this mean? This means that uh, um, aggregators, if they are not able to provide, uh, if they have uncertain pat uh, availability patterns, will start bidding less and less. And uh, what's really interesting is that the low penalty scenario, which is implemented in a real tender can, uh, can accept who can, cannot really in, well, provide the case for really high and successful activations. So what I'm marking here uh, with in red is the cases for the full day window at the company and commuter fleet, where we can see that in these cases, 30 up to 45% of 
uh, activations simulated were unsuccessful. So were less than the than 60% threshold. Uh, so this means that this penalty scenario can, in a way, endanger the grid if we don't uh, put uh, additional measures to to ensure uh, flexibility delivery. Uh, and as higher penalties as are are implemented, you will have a less flexibility bid. So you can see that in the case of the company fleet, it passed from seven kilowatt per EV to less than three. Uh, but with a higher reliability or, or flexibility. Uh, so we, we see that there is a trade-off between lowering barriers, entry barriers for aggregators uh, and flexibility reliability. So to conclude, uh, flexibility tenders uh, are an interesting mechanism to uh, allow DSOs to procure flexibility for their needs. Uh, and they could be also a first step to build liquid local flexibility markets or short-term flexibility markets. And that penalties are needed to ensure the flexibility delivery, but there will be a trade-off between reliability and volume. And the, the different stra penalty strategies that have been implemented uh, respond to different uh, visions of uh, DSOs. In the case of UKPN, they have a really low penalty scenario to boost the participation of new actors in these emerging markets. You know, they're building a new market, a new mechanism. So they keep entry barriers low. Uh, and then they expect that by learning, by doing effects, they will uh, be able to have a, a higher and well-functioning market. And on the other hand, then it's focused on higher reliability and the standardization with national markets. Um, and that's for me. Uh, Thank you for listening to me and please feel free to ask any question. Uh, yeah, Christoph, you can yeah, turn I'd, on the mic. Yeah, I just, uh, I just wanted to thank you uh, for the very interesting uh, presentation. Um, maybe you can jump to, I think it was page 11 or something. We'll figure it out. Uh, or no. So 10, 11. On the 11 is this maybe one? 13. Yeah, I think it's that. Yeah. Uh, here, because um, I'm sure you have explained it to me, but um, I'm just curious. The, the um uh, for example the red dots that you can see here this is this is not a function correct um, yeah it's not a function it's a simulation based results yeah okay so you have uh, for example you can have this the same c var value um leading to uh to different uh or in, in combination with uh, different average uh revenues um because then there must also something else uh um uh, come with a different setting, correct? Yes, yes. Yes, I, I was a little bit short on time, so I didn't explain very well this part. But basically, each one of these dots is a simulation at a different confidence level. For example, this is probably the, the bid at a 0 5% confidence level. So the aggregator bids a really high value of flexibility. Uh, however, since this value is really unreliable, there will be many cases where uh, they will not be able to respond to the activation. So they will be incurring a more and more penalties. So in average, they will be losing money due to the okay. penalties. And the CVAR, which is the risk measure, is the 5%, we use the CVAR at 5% to worst case. So we simulate a lot of activations. And in the 5% worst case, they will be even losing a lot of money, like more than 75 uh, euros per EV per year. So you can see that uh, if you go towards the right and up here, this, this is better for the aggregator because it has lower risk and higher average remuneration. And yeah, 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 it's a 
it's kind of a Pareto frontier between uh, risk and uh, average yeah, uh, I, margin. I understand now. Thank you. So, thanks, uh, Krista, for the uh, question. Uh, uh, any other question? question? Uh, okay. So if if you if there are no other questions, uh, we can go to the next presentation by uh, Thomas Verdery, uh, yes. which is going to present a, a paper on the application of a scaling down method to study long term effects of wind and solar on the French TSO tariff. So the floor is yours. Um, okay. I'm starting the timer. Okay, thanks a lot for having me. So I am Thomas Berdori, uh, a PhD student uh, that and I will speak about uh, the, the paper that is named Application of Scaling Down Method to Study Long Term Effects of Wind and Solar on the French TSO Tariff. I'm working with uh, RTE, the French TSO and CIRED, uh, which is a research institute that works on environment and development. So I will start with a bit of context, uh, what we have to know and what we, uh, we, we, we've seen a lot of articles and reports as to the national perspective electricity mixes, and that focus on consequences for uh, on national and international, international consequences. But um, those uh, different electricity mixes, they also have local consequences. Uh, here on the left, you see two different ways to geographically allocate solar panels, uh, one on rooftops and the other one on ground based panels. And uh, this, uh, those two uh, examples are two combinations, but uh, it, exp it exists a lot of uh, different combinations. And uh, according to the uh, geographic allocation, uh, one we can see that it will impact the power flow, the dimensioning, the flexibility, and also uh, the social accept acceptability, the environment, and, the, and a, a lot of different things. Uh, for uh, uh, TSO, the local uh, consequences can be seen the, at the uh, substations. So what is a substation then? A substation is the interface between a TSO and its client. And those clients can be both DSO or important factories. <clears throat> and uh, why, uh, why is it important for the TSO? It's because substations are nodes of the high voltage power grid. So knowing the residual loads curves of each substation is a, a very useful information for the, uh, for the grid exploitation. Uh, uh, residual load curves is the difference between um, local load and local production. <clears throat> so here you have two examples of um, of residual load curves. Uh, on the top, you have an example with uh, uh, only a client that uh, 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 consume energy. And the bottom, you have a, um, a case where you have a client that also produce a bit of energy. And one can see that the, in the first case, the scenario, uh, the, sorry, the TSO only see the demand curve, which is a light blue demand curves. But on the bottom one, it sees the darker blue uh, uh, demand curves. And one can see that if the production became too high, uh, maybe the, the TSO will also inject, uh, sorry, the client will also inject energy on the, on the TSO and it can have consequences on the, dim the, the dimension of the, of the TSO. So <clears throat> what we have done is that we have developed a model uh, to uh, calculate those residual load calls. Uh, and I will speak into details of how we do that. So, I will talk a bit about the model and the data. Um, <clears throat> so what we do is that we, we take national prospective studies and we apply the scaled down method uh, to the substation of the French TSO. Uh, so it's, uh, the model scales separately, the national load and production calculates the residual load curves of uh, each substation. Uh, I will not go into much detail of the scaling down of the load. But what you have to know is that uh, it tries to keep the characteristic of the load curves, uh, of the historical load curves of the different substations, like the thermosensitivity. Thermo um, and uh, that we use historical data from the TSO, so load data to, to do this. 
And for the production, uh, the production, uh, the scaling down of the production is scaled down using socioeconomic and grid data. Um, and uh, by having both, we can then calculate the residual loft curves of each uh, situation. I will uh, talk in too much detail of the scaling down of the production. Uh, the model uses two inputs. Uh, the first one is, is national wind and solar capacity. We only study uh, wind and solar capacities because they are the, of the two uh, way of produce uh, re renewable energy that will develop the most in France. Um, and, uh, and we want to uh, study the impact on the different residual load curves. Uh, we also distinguish, uh, distinguish uh, rooftops and wood-based panels uh, by using a parameter. So when we have, uh, um, we, uh, 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 we can study different scenario uh, when the, with more uh, ground-based panel or more rooftop parameter. Uh, once we've, uh, then uh, after we've determined how much uh, of those uh, different way of producing energy is, uh, uh, we will have, uh, we apply, um, uh, we, uh, uh, geographically allocated uh, each of the um, uh, each of those uh, uh, production sites. For rooftop panels, we use uh, assumptions and socio-economic data. For example, uh, for rooftop panels, uh, individual rooftop panels, we allocate the the panels according to the number of houses uh, in France. And for um, uh, commercial rooftop panels, we use the number of employees uh, in different sites. And for onshore winds production and wood based panel that are uh, bigger uh, uh, production sites, uh, we used the metal that is uh, the, um, described in the French TSO network development plan. Um, and we, what we have to do, what we have to know about this metal is, is just that it's trying to, um, to set the capacity in high potential area uh, while taking into account the trend of its installation. So we use a free allocative key. Uh, that goes from uh, that helps to go from national to substations, and uh, uh, one is using uh, the uh, local the, the renewable potential that is uh, estimated by, uh, by a union of producers. The second one is the uh, local trend of installations, and the third one is the um, uh, the capacity that is available at the substation. So this way we. Uh, uh, we allocate more uh, re renewable energy to substations that can uh, that can uh, connect them uh, easily. Um, and then we evaluate the consequences of uh, renewable energy uh, distributed uh, uh, energy under the French TSO using two elements. First, we calculate variables of interest for each residual load curve. Uh, two that are uh, currently using to um, uh, calculate the bill of each substation, so the reef drawn energy and the subscribed power, so the maximum of the demand curve and all the energy that is withdrawn uh, by a client uh, from the, T the TSO. Then the injected energy and the injected power, so if a uh, substation is, uh, has also uh, renewable energy connected to it, uh, it may sometimes inject energy onto, in, into the, 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 TS the TSO. Um, so this is the way we also get it both. And the dimensioning power, which is the maximum between subscribed power and injected power. And uh, it it, in fact, it's, um, it will represent in our article a uh, proxy of reinforcement. And uh, plus, uh, additionally, sorry, we also use the cost model, uh, which is the uh, really simple and only uh, represent a fraction of the grid reinforcement cost. So we calculate the transformer the reinforcement cost in used by uh, renewable energy at each substation. And uh, to do so, we assume a linear model, uh, linear, uh, linear relationship, sorry, uh, between the dimension power and the cost. Uh, so we'll talk a bit about the result that we, uh, uh, we have by applying our, our method. Um, <clears throat> in the article, we study the impact of Tirer on the uh, French TSO substation by 2030. Um, so we set the load and uh, everything else, and two parameters will vary. First, the national wind and solar production. So we study two scenarios, the business as usual scenario, that uh, is in fact, um, uh, how much capacity, capacity will be in France uh, if we are uh, uh, following the current path of uh, installation. And the PPE scenario, uh, which is uh, the capacity we would have if we follow the 
uh, governmental plan. So we can see that there's a quite a big difference between the two, uh, uh, the, the two, uh, the two scenarios. And then we also vary the rooftop versus ground panel parameter, uh, which we refer as T in uh, the, uh, the following the slides. Uh, and this value is in percentage. So um, what you have to know is uh, the, the lower means that uh, uh, the lower the parameter, the higher the capacity will be installed as a um, room-based panel parameter. So uh, a, value, a value of zero means that all the future, uh, all the new solar capacity will be ground panels and not, uh, and not uh, rooftop. Um, first, we so we applied our model and we then calculate the, um, the dimensioning power of uh, the different substations. And uh, what we see is that, we, uh, of course, the rise of DOL will impact the dimension power of uh, the substation. So on the left of the slide, you can see a repartition function of the delta of dimensioning power for the PPU uh, um, 2030 capacities. But what, what we can see is that the effect of DOL are quite heterogeneous. Uh, for most of the substation, the dimensioning power slightly decreases, while for a little number of substations, the dimensioning power increases a lot. And uh, what uh, you have to remember from this slide is that for the PPU capacity, almost 10% of the substation have a dimensioning power increase of more of 20 megawatts. Uh, and uh, you, you can say oh, 20 megawatts, what it is. In fact, it's uh, more or less the mean of, this, of the subscribe power of each, each substation. So, a rise of 20 megawatts is uh, important. Um, <clears throat> you can also see that there is three different, uh, uh, we computed this uh, repartition function for a three different value of the rooftop versus ground panel parameter, uh, but we cannot really uh, see uh, um, that much difference in the shape of the uh, repartition function. In fact, uh, this parameter will impact the cost, uh, the result of our cost model. Uh, here you have um, you have two. Uh, we calculate we uh, calculate the reinforcement cost uh, with our cost model for the PPU 2013 the business as usual uh, 2030 capacities. And what you can see first is that uh, the total obviously the total capacity of, um, of renewable energy will impact the cost uh, a lot. Uh, sorry, I haven't finished to describe the, slide, the graph yet. Um, for uh, 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 the light blue is the increases of uh, cost uh, produced by DRR. The uh, orange part is the decrease of cost uh, uh, produced by DRR. And then the, the dark blue is the total. So um, uh, for example, on the left, you can see that for the PPU capacity, and for T equal 25%, uh, the, the reinforced cost that we have calculated is in total uh, 144 uh, million euros. Um, uh, this decompose, uh, 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 yeah. Uh, and uh, <coughs> so the, the thing that you have to, to see here is that uh, the, obviously the total installed capacity will impact the cost, uh, but also the rooftop versus ground panel parameter will have more impact with higher solar capacity. So for the, uh, we can see that uh, costs may vary from uh, almost 50% uh, uh, between the T equal uh, the 25% and T equal 75% in the PPA capacity, while uh, the costs are not really um, uh, sensitive to this parameter in the business as usual scenario. Uh, it's because, uh, it's because uh, there is not enough solar capacity installed to see an effect. And uh, why does this uh, parameter impact? It's because it will impact the nearness between uh, production site and consumption site. Uh, because if you have a high value of this parameter, it means that you have more rooftop panels uh, which are next to consumption site. So, uh, it's, uh, um, so this, um, this uh, yeah, it, it's encouraged to, uh, um, to also look at this, uh, at this uh, parameter while uh, I think he could think he could ah, uh, while feeling um, a national perspective. Um, <clears throat> plus, uh, when, once we have calculated the cost, we also uh, calculated the tariff uh, revenue of each substation. So, how much, uh, uh, how much of the substation would pay uh, to the TSO. And what we can see is that substation with important rise of reinforcement cost also see that tariff bill diminishes. 
So on the left, you have a, um, a graph. On the x-axis, you have the delta of reinforcement cost, which we've calculated. On the y-axis, you have the delta of tariff. Uh, of tariff sorry. Uh, each point represents a substation, and each color of point represents an area uh, uh, um, on the, uh, the uh, rep, um, sorry uh, populated uh, a kind of populated uh, uh, oh sorry a, um, a curve of density of population. So, uh, it means that the if the, the, the green one is the very partially populated area, while the uh, red one are the very populated area. So uh, if it's green, it's rural. If it's uh, if it's um, red, it's uh, urban. Uh, and the figure shows two main things. First, that the rise of tariffs impacts the substation with a decrease of cost. So uh, it means that uh, the uh, impact of DUR on uh, inject on the withdrawn energy and subscribed power are different as, uh, uh, than the impact on dimensioning power. And then that most of the substation with a rise of reinforcement cost also sees their tariff bill decrease. So that uh, tariff and cost does, uh, are not going in the same in the same direction. So what we have to remember from this slide is that the error will impact differently the variables of interest, uh, which will affect the future tariff design. And uh, if I try to conclude from this um, uh, from this uh, presentation, um, <clears throat> oh, then uh, we can see that the scaling down method uh, allows to evaluate the impact of the error on the French TSO situation. Uh, the error will have into heterogeneous impact on the dimension and power of the different situation. Uh, this is what we've seen in, in, uh, with the repartition function. Uh, then that the total install capacity and the location uh, that also depend on social and political factor highly impact the results. So this encouraged to have a, a global vision of the, um, of the energy transition. And finally, that with the current tariff structure, the rate of the cost of the, at a substation induced by uh, renewable energy will not necessarily induce the rate of tariff for the substation. So uh, that is uh, it's also encouraged to work on future current tariff uh, uh, design. And um, what we have seen is that uh, uh, because um, uh, rural and urban area are not uh, um, uh, affected the same way, uh, our further work will study the distributive impact of the diffusion of uh, renewable energy. So thanks a lot for listening to my, uh, my presentation. Th thank you very much, Thomas, for the interesting presentation. So um, let's open the, the floor to the public. Uh, is there any question from the audience to Thomas? You can raise your hand. Uh, or just open your mic and uh, your microphone and, and your camera. Uh, for the moment, I have an, uh, a question. Uh, I really like your work. Uh, um, so you 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 show that the that the in a way that the tariff structure is not really cost reflective uh, for the. For the increasing penetration of DUR. So, what do you think might be the required, but the, the changes required for a better tariff structure? Okay, it's kind of a long and difficult question because uh, uh, the, the tariff structure uh, highly depends on the context uh, in which it, it has been built. And uh, for example, uh, in France, we have um, our tariff structure is. Most, uh, mostly depends on the energy withdrawn and not that much on subscribed power. Uh, and what we've seen is history is that uh, for TSO, we, uh, we guess that uh, costs are most power dependent than uh, uh, energy dependent. So a first good step would be to, uh, um, to balance more in favor of subscribed uh, power type. And maybe in the future, I know that the uh, National Regulation Authority is currently working on um, wine, uh, so thinking, thinking also into account in injecting energy and uh, injecting power for the future tariff structure. And um, it's uh, uh, maybe it's a good idea, maybe not, because uh, tariffs are only a part of the uh, world regulation process. So um, uh, I guess that my, my, my answer would be first, uh, uh, 
uh, use more uh, power to calculate the bill. And the second one is uh, given the um, uh, rethink the regulation uh, in the end to also uh, trying to think take into account the uh, injected energy and power that, uh, that may become more and more important in the, in the future. Yeah, yeah, you, you're completely right. Uh, interesting. Uh, also, what, what do you think is the role of flexibility and how they will affect uh, the business model or the revenues of TSOs? It's, it's a really good uh, uh, question because uh, <clears throat> when I show that slide of dimensioning power, uh, it showed that flexibility will also impact this, uh, this, uh, this value. And uh, I think it can help a lot to reduce the dimensioning power cost uh, in the, a lot of different ways. So um, one, of the, one of the hypotheses that we have here is that uh, maybe with more flexibility, uh, it will be easier to, uh, to connect more the air uh, to, uh, to the different costs. So I think it's kind of an enabler of the energy trans transition. So, um, so here you have, all, my work is like, uh, uh, can, oh, how can I say that? Uh, is giving, uh, let's say a need of reinforcement and but uh, reinforcement can be uh, solved in many, many ways and uh, increasing flexibility is one of them. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. I, I, I think I, in addition, the made like a similar study, but on the distribution side, which I think it was also at the substation level. So it's like the same thing, but from the other perspective and they are uh, proposing some kind of um, curtailment option for DERs that will, yeah. uh, according to them, like save them a lot of millions and millions in investments just by curtailing like two hours per year or something like that. So uh, that's, that leads me to another question is like, are you in contact with the people at, of NEDs that, or other DSOs that work in these same problematics? Uh, because they also build uh, like their prospective studies of uh, renewable generation penetration at the local level. Um, no, I'm not in contact with any of this, uh, but uh, in RTE, I, I, uh, I work with uh, people that are also uh, um, working on the, the flexibility subject. So, uh, and I think that they are working with any of this, so uh, uh, I'm not directly connected to them, but uh, one, uh, one network word away from, uh, from them. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, I've been working a little bit with some people of energy that was mm -hmm. were working on them, so we can talk a little bit later. Yeah. And uh, I have one last question. If there is no one in the audience to raise their hand, uh, really interesting uh, analysis uh, between the impacts of whether focusing on ground-based uh, solar versus uh, rooftop solar. So uh, if I understood correctly, uh, having more rooftop solar has positive effects uh, on the requirements for grid infrastructure, like uh, the impacts in additional oh. capacity are less. So do you think uh, this would be a this could have like a policy implication like ah oh yeah stop a uh, uh, pushing for ground ground based PV um, and focus on rooftop or not? Uh, uh, in fact, I'm not sure because it's only a part of the problem. So this TSO cost does not represent uh, uh, all the cost of the electricity electricity system, and uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, different implication as uh, flexibility uh, access. For example, it's way more easy to um, to uh, do a curtailment contract as you mentioned it with uh, uh, from uh, with uh, a ground based panel than from a lot of little consumer. So, um, <clears throat> in fact, I would not say it's an advocacy for more rooftop panels, but more in a, an advocacy for more um, global vision of the energy transition, <clears throat> because uh, um, <clears throat> because we can. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, we have to think globally and to look at all the costs and not only a fraction of the cost. Uh, 
So yeah, it's um, yeah, I would also like. That. Yeah, yeah, you are you're complete. I, I agree with you. So, thanks uh, very much, uh, Thomas, for Thank the you, for the presentation, for your work, and the interesting discussion. Um, so, I will ask you to stop sharing your slide, and we can keep on with the presentations. Uh, so, next one is uh, by Regina Hem. Uh, from the Austrian Institute of Technology, and she will be presenting uh, his uh, paper called the Market Participant, Par Participants of Retail Customer Flexibility by Pooling. So, Regina, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. <laughs> So um, today I will talk about a project where we want to bring consumer flexibilities to electricity markets. And um, they are not only spot markets, but also balancing markets. And the project um, is called Flex Plus. And there we want to, wanted to bring together all the necessary partners for a flexibility value chain. So um, we have three suppliers, which are um, providing the market access so they can do their trading at the markets for us. Uh, we have an IT service provider who is um, in charge of all the interfaces and the data transfer. We're working together with component manufacturers um, who are providing input for the physical models and the control. Of course, we have customers and um, there are several research institutes involved. And uh, for the consumer flexibilities, uh, we have uh, batteries, heat pumps, boilers, e-mobility, and also smart home. And the smart home is um, consisting of all the components above. And today I want to focus on the heat pump pool. Uh, but first, I want to show, give an overview about the architecture of our project. So um, on the bottom, we have the, the single components in the, in the household. So there are the heat pumps and battery storages, boilers and electric vehicles. And the aggregators, so the pools in the layer above, uh, they can access uh, things like storage levels and uh, other information needed um, and they the pools are calculating a schedule with uh, this information and also with market information which they get from the flex plus platform such as price forecasts for instance and um, when these schedules are calculated um, the, they are sent to the flex plus platform which is aggregating the data and the suppliers uh, in the top layer can access these information and these desired bits. So the pools give information about the desired bits at day ahead and balancing markets. And then the suppliers are trading at the markets. They get back an information whether the flexibilities have been or the bits have been accepted or not. And then this information goes back to the pools again, the pools can do either another optimization or if it's already fine, then they give the schedules to the single components. And uh, the single components are um, getting, receiving the schedules for the next day and following these schedules. And in case of uh, um, balancing activation, the information also comes from the suppliers through this platform, through the platform. Flex Plus platform over the pools to the components. Um, <clears throat> here is another overview about the structure of the heat pump pool, especially. So um, all these components have to be modeled in a mathematical model. Um, so the, the scheduling takes place as a mixed integer linear programming model. Um, so if you're not familiar with it, um, all these components are um, expressed as mathematical equations and there are some variables which the optimizer can choose. And there is also an objective function, which is in our case the cost minimization. So the minimization of the day ahead costs are the costs uh, which are um, um, which uh, come from the day uh, from the day ahead market. And as plus the revenues from the balancing reserve market. 
And um, all these components have to be expressed as mathematical equations. So there is the heat pump, there is a domestic hot water storage. Of course, there are also domestic hot water withdrawal profiles, there's a buffer tank, and there's a building model. And one layer here um, is one household, and they all the households are pooled, they are connected to a grid, they are also connected to an aggregator, and um, this aggregator also gets constraints from the different markets. Um, this should be an overview about the um, use cases we simulated. So um, I'll let the description there if you want to read it later, but um, I, I tried to uh, explain the scenarios. So there's the reference case where we are optimizing with flat price. This means that we have a uh, technical optimal schedule in the end, um, and we evaluate this schedule with the day head prices. And this is our reference scenario where we are comparing all other scenarios with. Then we have a day head scenario where uh, we, are, we have an, as an input the day head prices, and the component consumes when the day head prices are low. Then we have another scenario with primary balancing reserve. Um, due to technical restrictions, it's only possible for the battery to participate in this market. There, and um, we have a secondary balancing reserve uh, scenario and a tertiary balancing reserve. And for these two cases, um, we also have an intraday rebuy, which I will explain a little bit later. Um, <clears throat> then there's also they had an intraday scenario and a CO2 scenario, which I won't explain more on at this point. Um, for the balancing reserve, so um, we use the old market scheme where it's only possible to bid the day before or participate the day before at the balancing reserve market. So there are four hour products. Um, the power has to be reserved the day before for each time slot. And um, the component does not only have to reserve the power, but also, of course, the energy amount. So the, for instance, the maximum or minimum temperature must not be violated. And um, we assume call probabilities for each hour product. And the optimized can choose between two merit order list positions. So we can either bid at a low price and a high call probability or a high price with a low call probability. And for the balancing reserve, we also reduce, uh, we assume reduced grid costs. And um, the, Revenues which can be achieved by this uh, with this certain call probability influence the objective function and are being maximized. Um, and for the rebuy at the intraday market, so um, there are hourly purchases possible. And due to the call probabilities, uh, there is an expected most probable schedule. But of course, we also need to. Um, Note that there, there, there's a maximum and a minimum call um, could be as well. So probably we get um, activated more or less, but we don't know before. So we um, calculate the revenues with this call probability, but we also have to consider these extreme cases. And if we would reserve uh, the maximum minimum storage limit all day, then we could probably not bid that much uh, at the balancing market because maybe after one product and the maximum call, it could be full. So therefore we cannot um, offer more bids afterwards because we have to uh, be able to deliver this um, um, energy and power amounts. So um, we assume that we can rebuy the deviations from the probable case um, each hour at the intraday market. So I also have the graph here. Um, <clears throat> so um, the, the, the green line in the upper graph would be the temperature for the most probable case. And below you can see the offered amounts at the market. So in this case, there would be no, at the day head schedule would be zero, there would be no power offered at the day head market, but we are offering negative balancing energy. I mean, that's the, the sign is the other way around. Um, at the um, at the balancing markets. So we assume that we probably get uh, the green amount of energy 
for the most probable case. Uh, but it could also be that we get activated more and until this maximum call. And in case of a maximum call, the temperature would rise much more, as you can see in the upper graph again, and um, would deviate from the most probable case. And then it could violate temperature limitations. So we assume that we want to go back to our most probable case after each hour. And to do this, we have to reserve some power. And um, we have to reserve exactly this amount of power, um, the deviation from the probable case in the other direction. Um, this example is for a component which can inject and consume power from the grid. But of course, the, um, the they had skill to can shift it as well. So yeah, our optimization problem is considering this rebuy possibility as well. So the schedule look, for instance, like this when um, offering negative uh, flexibility. So the component would consume flexibility then in the time step afterwards. Uh, there is a, a slightly lower amount of the day head mark because if there would be a full call, the, this amount would be sold at the intraday market. Um, <clears throat> Then how did we model the physical components? I will just um, explain it very shortly. Um, <clears throat> for, the, for the mixed integer linear programming problem, we have to linearize everything, but binary variables are allowed. We get polynomials for the thermal power and the electric power dependent on the rounds per second from the manufacturer. We did a uh, linearization. And um, there, for instance, we have a binary variable because it can either be zero or between 30 and 100 rounds per second. And um, if you're interested, you can read it later how we modeled it or formulated it in mathematical equations. Um, and for the building model, uh, we used an RC model. So the um, a building state can be modeled as an electric circuit um, where the, resist the R is the thermal conductivity. And the C would stand for the specific heat capacity. There are five building masses. And this building model is calibrated then. That's another optimization process. Um, the R's and the C's are calibrated with historical data. And then we get a storage equation, which we use for our optimization problem. And then we are um, optimizing in the future. So uh, the results for the heat pump pool. So there is a total cost reduction up to 12% possible for the secondary use case. Um, of course, we will consume a little bit more of electricity because we're heating earlier and then there are more losses. Uh, we linearized everything. So it might be a little bit more of increase of electricity consumption in reality. Um, and we can see that the biggest share of cost reduction is, re is due to the reduced grid tariffs for balancing reserve. Um, <clears throat> and um, if we compare all prosumer technologies, um, we can see the, the same trend. So for the secondary balancing reserve, there are a lot of revenues or the most revenues possible. Um, for the PRL, only the battery is suited. Um, for the TRL, the revenues are quite low. And um, you yeah, can also see that the boiler, for instance, has more, um, more potential than the heat pump. And that's probably because the boiler has a bigger power um, than the heat pump. And yeah. So the yearly cost reduction could be between um, 59 and 84 euros per component per year. And um, speaking of revenues, I would like to draw attention to another project uh, we're working on. I want to mention this just shortly, but it's a research about the social acceptance factors for um, for uh, prosumer technologies, 
because as you've seen, the revenues are not enormous. And in this project, we want to find out by evaluating existing or past projects, whether um, the consumers, the consumers were more motivated by financial incentives or also environmental aspects and what uh, brings them to accept or reject consumer technologies. And so far we have been able to find out that financial motives are actually not that important. So people also really want to contribute to the energy transition. And users would like to do this with uh, as little additional effort as possible. So um, our concept of Flex Plus would be suitable for this because um, they don't have to do anything and everything is working automatically. Okay, so thank you for your attention. Feel free to ask any questions. Okay, uh, thanks uh, Regina for really interesting work, a really, really thorough model of, of different of all the markets, uh, the combinations of participation of these uh, distributed assets. Uh, uh, so, uh, as always, uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to raise your hand to open your mic uh, and your camera. So, um, well, I have some questions. So, first of all, uh, regarding the revenues that you showed, I was a little bit surprised by the low, yeah, that one, the really low value of uh, primary reserve remuneration. Uh, usually when I, well, I, I've seen most studies regarding electric vehicle V2G pro provision and providing primary response uh, with a V2G. Uh, and they usually show really higher values. And here you show that's mostly zero. Why do you think is that? Uh... Mm, to be honest, um, another research institute did the modeling for the battery pool. So I wasn't really involved in this. Um, I mean, <clears throat> on one hand, uh, the PRL is the only one which has to be offered symmetrically. Mm. But still, for the battery, this should be no problem. Okay. I, I would, but I can, I can ask uh, this colleague from the other research institute and <laughs> tell you afterwards or, or send you an email with the answer. Thank okay. You. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm sorry now. Uh, also, these uh, revenues are also only simulation. They are not like, no, okay. Yeah. So they are with perfect forecasts or perfect foresight, except for the activations. And the rebuys are also calculated within this. So the okay. Okay. But really interesting anyway and so you said that this is part of a project and you are you going to implement some of the algorithm algorithms to test uh, this how how real boilers for example or real heat pumps will respond to your algorithm yeah we are working on the demonstrations at the moment and yeah, for some components, it's easier to implement, for instance, for the boilers and for the heat pumps, for instance, there are some, there are more problems with forecast deviations and also with cal the calibration of the building model, because, for instance, we don't have the irradiance from the real uh, location of the household. And um, therefore, if there is a big tree or something, we don't know that. So the shattering of the house is, or, and the, uh, um, the energy which comes from the solar irradiation is quite difficult to, um, to assume, actually. And for some houses, it's working quite good already, and for other ones, not yet. And yeah, we're working on it that we can find the, the problems and mm. make it work for all of them. Yeah. So. Um, so regarding all the thermal 
comfort modeling, you use, you create some forecast for the thermal requirements. And uh, um, after that, you optimize the heat pump uh, consumption. Mm -hmm. And how do you build these forecasts? What are your assumptions? Um, they are indirectly um, considered in this building model. So we have uh, forecasts for the weather, for the outdoor temperature and for the irradiation. And also we assume something for the internal masses um, or the, yeah, for instance, a refrigerator also gives some heat. And um, then since we, and then we're using these equations and um, yeah, the aim of the optimizer is to keep the temperature limit between two, that's the maximum and the minimum temperature. And um, yeah, the, the, the heating or the amount of the heat pump or the energy amount which comes from the heat pump is the optimization. So this can be varied and yeah, the, the model is calibrated with old data from the last two days of irradiation weather and so on. And then this calibrated model is used for two days in the future. And the only optimization variable is with forecast. And the only optimization variable is the, um, yeah, the heating amount, which goes into the floor mode. OK. Really interesting. And I, if there is another question from the audience. Uh, yes, actually, I have a question. Cool. Uh, I saw that, I don't know if I understood correctly, but uh, your model predicts the, the need for flexibility for the next day, and you're simulating on four hour time steps? Um, it doesn't really, the model gives a schedule and the bits, so the bits at the day head market and the flexibility bits, and we assume some activation, but the activation can be more or less. So, yeah, the... Okay, but the time steps are for... I saw that there were four hour the, time steps written. Um, the time steps are 15 minutes and the oh, okay. balance effect is four hours. So if you offer a certain reserve, then you have to keep... Uh, or this has to be the same for four hours. Okay, okay, okay. That's a requirement so, uh, from the balancing market. Um, and four components that. can easier fulfill this requirement than one component. So that's also why the, the pooling makes sense. Yeah, uh, yeah, okay. Because I also uh, had some, I saw, I found it very strange that the primary reserve is very low, it generates very low income, uh, honestly. But uh, I don't know, it's, uh, yeah, uh, I, I thought it was because uh, of the time steps. I understood uh, wrong, so it's my bad. Sorry. No, sorry. Um, and I ask. Um, no, go ahead. Mary, <laughs> and come back to you. <laughs> okay, I have one final question, and uh, is uh, okay. Your heat pumps. Uh, they act uh, in both ways, so you can heat them, but they are also used as cooling devices? Uh, no, they are just used for heating. Okay, and how many days a year are you using the heat pumps? Um, do you take that into account in the revenues that you computed? I mean, I imagine like you use your heat pump, I don't know, half, uh, I don't know, 100 or 200 days a year. A year at most, and not every day. Um, since it is implicitly um, considered in the building model, because if the if the outdoor temperature is very high and the irradiation is quite high, for instance, in summer, then the heat pump doesn't have to heat at all, and the cheapest is not to heat. So that's we did a yearly simulation, but um, I can tell you how many days there was heating or not because it depends on the on the outer temperatures in the weather forecast. And not just the okay. also the, the real. Uh, okay, okay, but yeah, yeah, cool. It's 
taken into account when you simulate the whole year and uh, interesting. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Regina, for the presentation. Really cool models. Um, the, we will go to the next um, and final presentation of this session, which is by Christoph Schick from the University of Stuttgart. And uh, he will be presenting uh, his paper on the impact of grid charge mechanisms on prosumers and the energy system. So, Christoph, uh, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. So, let me share the screen. Can you see already my screen or does it not work? Me, not yet. Okay. Me neither. Let me try again. Okay, I'll try again. So now you should see my screen, hopefully. Yes, I see your screen now. Okay. Yeah, so hello again from my side. I'm happy to be with you, even though it's just um, a digital meeting. Um, and um, I will speak about the impact of uh, network charge mechanisms on consumers, prosumers, and the uh, energy system. And um, yeah, this is the table of content. I will give you an overview first, um, then speak about the methods, um, results, um, give you the conclusions and also the references. Um, so the, the starting point of um, our analysis is that the, the transformation of our energy system um, really goes hand in hand with the um, stronger use of uh, distributed um, energy sources, um, namely distributed PV. And also um, a lot of those PV systems will come with um, battery systems. So we have a new group of, um, of end customers that um, yeah, have already been mentioned in the, in the other presentations as well. Um, these are the, the prosumers um, who become active market participants and um, can take an active role in the energy system. Um, and this um, active role is, is given by um, their decisions how to operate um, their batteries. And in principle, one could uh, distinguish uh, three prototypical battery operation modes. Um, the first one is really uh, oriented um, at the uh, individual profit maximization. Um, and this heavily depends on the regulatory framework. Um, and we'll speak about that in a second. Um, and in cases of uh, frameworks um, that um, depend on yeah, volumetric elements such as volumetric network charges or volumetric renewable energy support costs, um, this um, self-consumption, uh, this profit maximization um, equals um, self-consumption maximization. And the scope of analysis in this case is really uh, the individual household. But batteries could also operate um, uh, grid uh, uh, with an orientation to the grid network beneficially uh, to reduce um, peak coincident network um, capacity utilization. In this case, the scope of analysis is tens to hundreds of households, which is the typical of number of households uh, that are connected um, to um, distribution um, network node. And finally, um, batteries could operate um, market beneficially um, in order to leverage portfolio effects um, with the goal to um, optimally integrate renewable energy in the system and holds a market level. And in this case, um, we speak about thousands to millions of households. And um, as I said, um, the actual decision um, how to operate the battery really depends on the regulatory framework, which um, provides uh, an incentive for the prosumer to do it either or the other way. And um, here we focus on a very, very important part of this regulatory framework, which um, are the, the network charges. And the question that we have is how do different network cost allocation schemes provide different incentives for different battery operation modes? 
um, that lead to different household energy bills, that lead to different utilizations of the distribution network, and ultimately also to different um, system costs. So, um, yeah, this is the workflow of our analysis. And um, as I said, what we are really interested in is um, to have a kind of a holistic picture of the situation. So we want to have um, a closed loop analysis um, that uh, integrates the individual impacts, um, which um, will be given by a consideration of the full costs of electricity. Um, we will have a um, look at the local impacts uh, by um, analyzing the distribution network capacity utilization. And we will also have a global perspective uh, by consideration of the system costs. And we will do this for the three prototypical battery operation modes um, that I just um, spoke about. And here again, you see these um, operation modes denoted by one, two, and three. Um, and we will combine these modes with two also prototypical um, network cost allocation mechanisms. And the one mechanism that we are uh, analyzing are volumetric network charges, and the other are um, peak capacity charges. Um, and I will speak about those um, in a second uh, in more detail. Okay, so let us start with the battery operation mode one. Um, this is um, the individual uh, profit maximization. Um, and in this case, we assume that this equals, as I said, um, a maximization of self-consumption. Um, and to be uh, precise, um, there, is no, you, there is no unique solution uh, to this, uh, but there are several possibilities to maximize your self-consumption but we um, stick to a certain um, often used um, prosumer heuristic, which we call the chronological charging and which works uh, like the following. So in case of um, positive prosumer PV production, you would first try to self-consume your electricity directly. Um, if this is not possible, you would try to store surplus PV electricity into your battery storage. And if this is not possible because your battery storage might be fully loaded, you would then feed in surplus electricity into the public grid. And in the case you don't have prosumer PV production, you would first try to discharge your battery storage to cover your electricity demand uh, from your own uh, energy. Um, and then if this is not uh, possible because your battery might be empty already, you would uh, finally withdraw electricity from the public grid. And by implementing this algorithm, one um, will get a prosumer residual load. And also, I'm very happy for that. Uh, the residual load has already been uh, explained earlier, so I don't need to do it here. So output is a single household prosumer residual load. And with this information, you can then uh, already yeah, evaluate the full cost of electricity for the prosumer, which typically um, consists of yeah, three parts. Um, the one is the investment costs. The second part are the wholesale market costs, which is basically the energy withdrawn from the grid times the average wholesale market prices um, and also remuneration in cases of feed-in weighted by the actual market value of PV. And then you have all the regulatory components. And as I said here in this analysis, with this, which is really a, high -life, a highly stylized approach, uh, we are focusing on the network charge part only. And uh, this is some kind of uh, a function which is um, depending on the residual load times uh, specific network charges. And these components are defined in more detail later on. Um, so now we take the next step and we go up to the distribution grid level. Um, and want to understand what is the residual load of prosumers and consumers that are connected to a certain uh, distribution grid node. And I have to say again, um, we made um, a couple of simplifications. So we really assumed um, a radial network topology throughout um, our analysis. Um, we're working with prototypical um, profiles, um, prosumer and consumer um, residual load profiles. And I didn't mention it, um, but uh, what I think is cool about our analysis is that we are really using actual data. So the, the load profiles are quarterly hour um, 
um, profiles that are measured uh, from a single family household in the city of Düsseldorf and also the PV profile is an actually a measured profile. Um, and to actually um, calculate the residual load at node level, um, we need to superpose um, the prosumer and the consumer residual loads. Um, and we do this by um, assuming 75% um, of the households connected to the node as uh, prosumers and the remaining 75, 25% uh, uh, as consumers. So this is the superposition what we need to do. But even more importantly, we also need to take into consideration the simultaneity effects. And we do this by um, Gaussian smoothing. Um, which is a common method also applied in other fields, such as uh, image processing. There, I think it's referred to as a Gaussian blur. And this uh, takes into account uh, the simultaneity effects uh, that are important on the uh, distribution uh, network level. And one can really check that this approach is a valid one if you compare um, the, the red curve, which is um, our Gaussian smoothing to the theoretical uh, um, functional dependency of the simultaneity factor, which I think was originally derived by Rusk et al. Uh, in 1956, and with, which goes with the one over square root of n uh, dependency. And so you see that our approach of smoothing um, is a valid one. So now um, uh, what we achieved is the um, aggregated residual load of prosumers and consumers um, at the grid node level. Um, and now we need to speak about uh, the network charges. Um, for the volumetric network charges, it's, it's really a simple thing. You basically just multiply the annual amount of energy withdrawn from the grid with the specific uh, volumetric network charges. And for the peak coincident capacity charges, you do it differently. Basically, what you do is you first calculate the aggregated residual load on the network node, then you sort it um, by magnitude. And for the top 30 residual uh, load power peaks, uh, you then take uh, the prosumer and the consumer shares into account, average over it, uh, and this then enters the equation, uh, this residual load multiplied with a specific capacity charge. And usually um, this term would not fully compensate for the total network costs. So what we did here is we added our fixed network charge per customer compensating for the residuum. Um, and um, this approach is um, referring to um, Paris Ariaga um, and et al. Um, with a yeah, very interesting and good um, study from MIT um, that basically also explained uh, the theory behind this approach and why it's basically kind of an ideal network charge mechanism. Okay, and finally, we go even one step further and take on the system perspective. And what we now do is um, we further smooth the aggregated um, load from prosumers and consumers at wholesale market level, take this as an exogenous time series uh, which then enters um, a linear optimization model of the European electricity market, um, E2M2, which is um, um, defined uh, and explained in detail by SUM. Um, and the specific model structure and parameter setting that we used um, is given in uh, Schick et al. in an um, IEEE paper from 2020. Um, just um, yeah, with uh, respect to the limited amount of time, I, I tell you that it's it's a model which, uh, of course, um, depicts several characteristics of the electricity market, such as low coverage, of course, system adequacy, and rest investment practice. Okay, so here we can now then do the optimization of the total system costs and figure out the optimal system costs um, with this um, battery operation mode. And for battery operation mode two, the, the overall picture is the same. We first evaluate um, a single residual load profile. We then smooth it and aggregate it um, to uh, analyze network capacity utilization. And then we further smooth it and um, put it in as an exogenous time series into our system model. So the overall analysis is the same. The difference now is that 
the actual um, household um, optimization algorithm is different because this time we do not only want to maximize self-consumption, but also we want to reduce peak capacity network utilization. And to do so, we formulate the problem as an optimization problem with objective function as the self-consumption and several restrictions um, that depict the, yeah, the physical picture of the situation. So low coverage, capacity and storage constraints. And most importantly, we now have this peak capacity restriction for the aggregated residual load at the node, which basically says, okay, the aggregated node at the uh, load at the node should be lower than an upper bound. And what we now do is we iterate over this whole thing um, and step by step make this upper bound uh, lower and lower until the problem is no longer solvable. And by this, we can really figure out what is the lowest upper bound uh, for the residual load that is achievable. And then um, we stop and again, we get a residual load for the prosumer, but this time it's really a different residual load. Um, and with this residual load, we do all the steps of the analysis as mentioned before. And finally, um, we go to battery operational three. We remember here um, the rational is to minimize the total system costs. And this approach is really uh, different uh, because this time we start with the minimization of total system costs and we leave the battery operation as a degree of freedom for the system. So um, we first do the optimization and then the battery operation is a model endogenous result of our optimization. And this is really vice versa uh, to the um, approach we did before. Before we first modeled the consumer behavior exogenously and this entered then the system model. This time we do the system model first and figure out what would be um, a market friendly battery operation um, that minimizes total system costs. And then we get again, um, a residual load profile and we can now do the analysis um, as for the other uh, operation modes um, to analyze the network utilization and the full cost of energy as for operation modes one and two. The only difference now is um, as we start with the wholesale market um, perspective and then we go down to uh, network level and household level, instead of smoothing what we needed to do uh, for modes one and two, we now need to make the profiles sharper. And this is uh, performed using the theoretical uh, functional dependency of the simultaneity factor that um, I presented on page 11. Okay, you have uh, three minutes left. All right, so <laughs> I give you the results now. Thanks uh, for the hint. Um, with uh, uh, respect to the system perspective, here you see the um, in uh, light blue the CO2 emissions and in dark blue the system costs for the different operation nodes. And what you can really see is that for the market-oriented uh, battery operation, um, the uh, total system costs um, are lowest and also the CO2 emissions um, are lowest. And this is because in this uh, battery operation mode, you really have the best um, renewable energy integration um, leading to um, yeah, uh, um, a reduction of CO2 emissions um, of uh, corresponding costs and also of uh, fuel deployment and corresponding costs. And um, if you have a look at the network utilization level, um, here depicted in these figures are the um, momentary residual loads um, sorted by their magnitude. Um, and what you can see is that as expected for the static battery operation from a system perspective, the um, residual load is the highest for the chrono chronological charging scheme with 2.9 kilowatt per household and the lowest uh, for the grid oriented battery operation mode. And what you also can see is that um, the stress on the network for operation modes one and two is really driven by the feed-ins, so negative residual loads. And for the market-oriented mode, it's really a mix between feed-in and grid load. And this is also um, visible in this figure where you have the, the shares of feed-in and grid load um, from the residual load um, and the intersections here basically uh, represent the points in order time up to which feed in and demand peaks have equally contributed to the network capacity utilization and you see 
um, for operation mode three way earlier, um, feed in and, and grid load um, are in an equilibrium, uh, then it's the case for operation modes one and two. And finally, the end customer effects. Um, here now you have the energy bills um, normalized to 800 euros per annum for volumetric and peak um, capacity charges and also for the three operation modes. When, what you can see is really that the peak capacity charges um, tend to lower the gap between prosumers and consumers. Here, the gaps are always lower, even reverse uh, in this case. Um, but what you can also see is that the market beneficial battery operation, this is mode three, is neither favorable for volumetric nor for peak capacity network charges. So you need um, further improvements of the regulatory framework in order to have the um, market-oriented battery operation. And this is basically already one part of the conclusions. Um, again, we try to evaluate the impact at uh, different uh, levels, in which all local and system level. Um, we saw that volumetric network charges tend to favor battery operation modes that are neither grid nor market oriented. Um, peak capacity charges in turn could constitute um, incentives for different battery operation modes that could reduce part of the inequalities between consumers and consumers and simultaneously re release the distribution network. Um, and what we will do in a subsequent uh, paper based on the work that I presented here is um, to um, also analyze um, further improvements of the consumer heuristic um, that explicitly account for consumer response to a changed regulatory um, framework. Thank you very much for your attention. And yeah, I'm happy to answer your questions. Uh, thanks, uh, Christoph. Really interesting work. Uh, I really like this analysis between the impact of volumetric versus capacity-based charges. Uh, so let's open, yeah. So just raise your hand uh, or open your camera if you want to ask a question. Um, for the moment, I have one. Um, first, uh, I didn't understand uh, why you did smoothing. Uh, if you have already a data set of real houses, of real cons consumption. So maybe how many households do you have in your data set and why you, yes. was smoothing needed? It's, it's a really good and valid question. So I think we have um, kind of um, 10 to 15, I, I need to figure it out, but 10 to 15 different household profiles. Um, so I could do um, the, I, or could skip the, the smoothing and just um, aggregate those 15 different household profiles and see what, um, what happens. But um, I um, said that um, to realistically depict also larger network nodes with, um, let's say, um, hundreds of, um, of consumers, um, uh, we um, did another approach and we basically um, picked one prototypical profile, just one, um, and our whole analysis is then based on this um, load profile and um, the specific PV profile. Um, and because we just used uh, one prototypical profile, we then needed to uh, do this smoothing because we didn't aggregate different um, household profiles. Um, we also um, could compare um, the results. Um, on the one hand, the smoothing, on the other hand, um, really um, aggregating um, uh, different uh, different profiles but I am pretty sure that the results won't be much different uh, for our analysis because what really matters uh, in view of the peak capacity charges is is really um, um, the the residual load um, on the node um, and and I think this is kind of yeah generically depicted by by the approach um, that we used but um, it's a very valid question that you ask. Okay. Yeah, thanks. It's interesting. And um, well, and this does this Gaussian smoothing has our have you studied the validity of this of, uh, formula for doing the the, yeah. the smoothing or yeah, yeah. And um 
I, I mean, I did it myself basically and also figured out that uh, I think other smart people have done it already uh, in the literature. And I think it's really uh, these guys here, Rask et al. from 1956 or already, um, that derived this formula. And it's it's not basically um, a good surprise or something that these curves fit so well together, but actually, um, as far as, as I understand, the theoretical derivation of this formula basically um, heavily depends on an approach of, of uh, Gaussian smoothing. And the idea basically is that um, if you start with a typical sharp profile, then the uh, probability that um, um, a certain value in a certain uh, time, um, let it be t0, is shifted uh, in temporal dimension to the left and right um, is really weighted uh, with the probability given by a Gaussian function. So it's really um, um, like, yeah, improbable to have a profile where the, um, the momentary values um, deviate by a large amount of time and it's really uh, more probable uh, to generate a second profile, which just deviates by, let's say, an hour or a quarter hour from the original profile. So this is the theory, but also a very good question because this functional dependency is not unique for the simultaneity factors. And in fact, there is other literature which has other functional dependency. Um, and this is also empirical and theoretical work. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting uh, because I was thinking about that because uh, with uh, the more response, this simultaneity could be getting higher. For example, if everyone is responding to low prices hours. Yes. Uh, so that Gaussian smoothing might not be valid in uh, in the future smart grids. So uh, yeah, I, I, there's a point to think about that. Yeah. I, I totally agree with you. If you have this uh, interaction, this direct uh, reaction to, let's say, for example, a price signal or something, then you will have more, yeah, um, focused uh, times uh, that everyone will try to use. And then there are less uh, focused times that no one is trying to use. And I agree with you that um, if you integrate this, um, then um, you really need to rethink about this, this approach. And typically, I would expect that the residual uh, power peaks uh, could be higher than um, if, if really um, you're more price uh, reactive. So it would really even amplify the effects that we have figured out here. Yeah, it's a really good point, I think. Yeah, it's, yeah, I was actually was studying that, but in the case of electric vehicles, so they are really responding that electric vehicles that respond to the electricity prices and trying to calculate some simultaneity factors so if you are interested uh, i can send you the manuscript okay. yeah sure um uh so any other question from the audience um, I, I think demand response is a bit different because it's more non-linear than uh, than EV charging. I'm actually working with demand response. Mm. And it depends on the hypotheses you take vis-a-vis uh, -vis the activation or the, the responsiveness of the individuals, because at the end, this is not a smart charging station. It's a person who's gonna either turn on or turn off their, uh, their uh, boiler or their uh, electric heating or whatever based on a price signal. So if, if the function isn't directly integrated in smart metering, and if the smart meters don't actively cut off or start consuming, it's uh, quite difficult, uh, especially for the costs, because the DSO is going to pay that cost if they're using it for uh, voltage control. So there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, I'm going to say not inconsistencies, but non-linearities in this uh, specific uh, operational model. Uh, so yeah, I would just wanted to, to add to the R thing. Uh, also, yes, also uh, for the batteries participating in the markets. Um, I, in the French case, if you are a producer, 
and you want to inject on the grid, you have to pay for the grid usage uh, uh, tariffs. And uh, normally the market prices do not reflect that. So in the case of batteries using the distribution network or the transmission network directly or indirectly, uh, do you, is there a pol policy framework that uh, allows them to directly uh, to, to get uh, the market price or do they have to pay also the, the grid usage prices? Because... Um, yes, I think this is, um, so to speak, um, work in progress because I think the, uh, also in Germany, the, the regulatory framework is, is changing and this has been a discussion uh, um, for years, I think exactly this point. Um, so to be honest, I right now I can't tell you exactly what the, the regulatory scheme in Germany is, but as far as I know, at least in the in recent times, as you said, as you mentioned, you needed to pay this um, uh, this fee for uh, for uh, grid usage, um, and you wouldn't in most cases you wouldn't see the the wholesale market prices, which is really um, kind of the, also the starting point of this analysis, uh, because I said, okay, as you don't really see the, the market price, you would work with heuristics or with something that is not a, a totally market-oriented mode, and this really leads then to inefficiencies in the market. Because in the case of self-consumption, collective self-consumption, um, it's not profitable to do it because of the tariffs. So uh, the, the usage of the, these tariffs, of the grid tariffs, really kill the self-consumption project and it becomes okay. the okay. same so price as the grid price. As the this, is, this, is, this is interesting because I'm pretty sure that this is uh, not the case uh, in Germany. In fact, I think this is really the number one rationale for um, private households investing in battery systems that they use those uh, to increase their their self consumption and uh, and nothing else basically. So uh, this is this is really interesting. I didn't know that this uh, is really different. Um, uh, yeah, I am uh, talking about collective self consumption, not. Ah, yeah. Okay. Okay. For energy communities, this is the thing that that uh, makes it on the yeah. same level of cost as the, especially with the big capex for the PVs. Okay, so this, we, we have we have here too, this is, um, yeah, the, in Germany it's Quartierslösungen, uh, uh, which is, um, yeah, really relating to this issue. Okay, we have, we have this here as well, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we are on time. Uh, I will stop the recording now and I will close the session, but I will, leave the channel open a little bit if we you have to, to um, you want to have further discussions